Good morning, Real Southern people. Um, it is Tuesday morning. We are late with Bible study yet again. I told you we were, our kids are on vacation this week. So Amy got up this morning. We all slept late and she made pancakes. And uh, so we're getting our study starting a little later than we should. But I wanted to come in and tell y'all uh, good morning before we do our Bible re our book review and say, uh, I'm glad that you're tuning in and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful uh, Tuesday. We are going to be studying the doctrine of salvation today. So it will be really nice. And I'll encourage you to read the extra uh, scriptures today sometime, um, if you get a chance, hopefully, or even on another day, because this one's really important. So um, I'm going to sign off and then sign back on for the Bible book review. Good morning, it's Tammy with Real Southern Woman, and we will be talking about chapter 28 in 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. That book is written by Max Anders, um, and it's called 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. We're now on chapter 28. So this is our 28th Bible study in this book. This one is on the doctrine of salvation. Um, it says, uh, we're just going to review the book today, okay? So it says, in studying the matter of man's destiny, we actually overlap with our overview of the doctrine of salvation. We saw earlier that man has a spirit as well as a body, and that he will live forever forever in heaven or hell. The immediate concern, then, is what determines his destiny. The Bible appears to teach that children who die before the age of accountability, that is, the age at which they have the intellectual capacity to accept or reject God, go to heaven. After they reach that age, if they do not accept God's salvation before they die, they will go to hell. How then does man avoid that destiny? And what is the basis of God's salvation? There are several commonly held beliefs about how to get to heaven. One belief suggests that if no really terrible sins are committed, God will overlook the small ones. Another suggests that if your good works outweigh your bad works, at the end of your life, you will make it to heaven. Still another suggests that God will line up all the people in the world who ever lived, from the worst to the best, and divide that line in half, and the worst go to hell and the best go to heaven. All of these beliefs are incorrect. Good and bad works have absolutely nothing to do with whether or not you go to heaven. Now we see that he does a review of the doctrine of the Bible, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of angels, the doctrine of man, and the doctrine of sin. Then we go to, there, there are four major subdivisions of the doctrine of salvation. They are basis, result, cost, and timing. The basis is the key to the understanding. The result is shows a butterfly. I would imagine that's because we get our wings to get to get to get into heaven. And the cost is Christ dying on the cross, which is shown in a cross. And then the timing um, shows a window with a cross in it, which I'm assuming that would be the church or the age of grace. So let's talk, let's, let's review it. It says salvation is a gift God gives to those who believe. That's the basis. It says that we cannot earn our salvation. We are imperfect and we cannot make ourselves perfect. Yet God demands perfection. Oh, it's, I'm sorry. I think I read that wrong. It says we cannot earn our salvation. We are imperfect and we cannot make ourselves perfect. Yet God demands perfection. 
Therefore, all we can do is cast ourselves on God's mercy. In his mercy, God offers to forgive our sin and give us a new nature of holiness so that we can be in a perfect relationship with him. The completion of that relationship is not realized until we die and we shed the body of sin in which we live. God's offer has one condition, that we believe in and receive Jesus as our Savior. The central passage for this is, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. The next subdivision is result. God extends forgiveness of sin and eternal life to those who accept him. God's solution to man's inherent dilemma is to offer him forgiveness of his sins and to give him a new nature that is not flawed. Man still languishes under the impact of sin until his flawed body dies and he receives a new body. Then he is free to serve God forever in heaven in undiluted righteousness. So this talks about a new nature that we get with the result. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 1. The next one is cost. The penalty of sin is paid for by the substitutionary death of Christ. That is a long word for us to have to fill in a blank for, huh? Substitutionary. Sin brings death since we all have sinned, all have died spiritually and are separated from God. Jesus was without sin and he, will he willingly died with the understanding that his death could count as a substitution of our own. If you believe in Jesus and receive him as your personal Savior, God will then count his death for yours and give you eternal life. The central passage for this is, For Christ also died for sins once for all, and just for the unjust. I mean, the just for the unjust in order that he might bring us God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. The last one is timing. Our salvation is completed at the death of the body. Man is body and spirit. Upon becoming a Christian, a person's spirit is born again. My um, washer's beeping. I'm going to wait till it finishes. Okay. Man is body and spirit. Upon becoming a Christian, a person's spirit is born again, and he is given eternal life. His body at that point remains unchanged. It is corrupted by sin, is susceptible to disease and death, and is inclined to sin. The brain, which is part of the physical body, is still encumbered with old programming that it is counter to biblical, that is counter to biblical truth. Because of this, the Christian experiences a continuous struggle between the new inner man who wishes to serve God and the outer man who feels the pull to sin. See Romans chapter 7. This conflict continues until the death of the body, at which time the spirit of the Christian is transported immediately to heaven to receive a new body untouched by sin that scripture is romans 8 23 if you want to read that it says fortunately until our salvation is completed with the redemption of the body when we sin after having become a christian we have an advocate with the father jesus the righteous so, until our salvation is complete with the redemption of the body, which means until we pass away, then when we sin after becoming a Christian, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is in 1 John 1, chap, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. God does not want us to sin, but he recognizes that as long as we are in his body, in this body here, we will. When we do, he cleanses us. The death of Christ on the cross was sufficient for all of our sins, past and future. God is continuously working in our lives, however, to lead us to a more righteous lifestyle. If we resist this work of God, he chastens us as any loving father would a child to correct inappropriate behavior. See Hebrews chapter 12, verses four through 13. The central passage is, and not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Romans chapter eight, verse 23. And then he just goes over the review of what we've talked about, gives us a self-test, comes back to our symbols, and tomorrow we review the doctrine of the church. Now, the only thing he doesn't talk about in this is that we do need, in order for us to have salvation, we really have to know that we need a savior. Um, we have to know that we're sinners. And the only way we know that we're sinners is if the Holy Spirit pricks our heart or may, opens our eyes and ears and lets us see and hear the word of God so that we can see the sin in our lives. And once we see the sin in our lives, regardless if we believe in Christ or not, it's up to us then to give our life over to Christ because we know that we need him as a savior. Just believing in Christ is not salvation. Um, and we cannot earn salvation. So the way that we actually are saved is through the Holy Spirit drawing us. Um, and I do not have that written down. So I guess I can touch on that tomorrow before we start in with the doctrine of the church, because that is very important, a very important part of salvation. So he really doesn't tell us spiritually how to be saved here. This is more of the doctrine of salvation, which is just what salvation is. So um, that's the difference in this study and if someone were actually telling you how to be saved. But I hope you have enjoyed the Bible study and I'm sorry I'm late. Like I said, um, the kids are off of school and we're getting up late and we're getting breakfast late and we're getting started late. So I appreciate y'all under having an understanding this week on our time schedule. Um, I hope y'all have a wonderful and blessed week. This has been a wonderful Bible study. Um, and like I said, this is our 27th uh, day in this book and it is such a blessing. Um, let's say our prayers and then we will go and uh i hope we all have a great day dear heavenly father we just thank you so much for um the opportunity that you give us to talk to you and through you and about you on social media that we live in a place where we can do that without uh being in trouble or getting put in jail we thank you for your word we thank you for your salvation you, we thank you for your son your holy spirit and your timing in our lives. I hope that you are with us each and today and that you watch over us and keep us from temptation. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank all of y'all for being here. I love each and every one of y'all and um, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Bye.